second installment of the Illinois series. Yes, I have. Have you been to Champagne lately? Yes. My alma mater. Really? Yeah. Oh. A couple of years ago. Okay. It's a particular pleasure. Actually, this is not only the Illinois series, but I confess this is the My Former Student series. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Lisa Valmolina, whom I have known since her undergraduate days, her graduate school days, and now her days as a tenured faculty member at the University of Illinois. <laughs> the culmination of which is about to occur now. Uh, Isabel, as you will see shortly, is a really terrific, innovative uh, scholar in the area of race, ethnicity, and communication. Her book, Dangerous Curves, with a really sexy cover, so you want to go look it up, uh, was recently published by New York University Press, and she will speak today on the critical reflection on the commodification of the community Thank you. So I'd like to thank Larry for inviting me to be here with you today. It's uh, wonderful to continue having him be my advisor 10 years after I graduated with my PhD, and we won't say when that was. So thank you, Larry. Uh, and thank you, Mina, as well, for making sure I got here safe and sound and on time. Well, that would be Sarah, too. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about what my general interests are and why I engage in this kind of research. Uh, since my undergraduate days, uh, I was involved in journalism, very committed to, to being a journalist, um, in particular because I wanted to work on issues of ethnicity and race and gender and sexuality. I wanted a chance to, to give voice to those communities that I felt really closely uh, aligned with and, and to do so in a way that was complex and nuanced. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, that, that was really what has defined my work in this area from a very early stage. Uh, when I went to the Anna Brook School for my master's and uh, my PhD, I continued to work on issues of ethnicity, race, and gender. We can talk about why I switched careers <coughs> during the question and answer session, but um, I did. Uh, but I still kept my focus on it, and I've continued, obviously, to work in that area since then. Um, you know, part of what I wanted to do was fill a void that I saw of invisibility in that scholarship. Um, and, um, and so I've uh, worked with a colleague to start a division on ethnicity and race in the International Communication Association. And what was interesting to me at the time was how many people asked why we wanted this division, why it mattered, and what it had to do with communication. And, uh, and so uh, it was, you know, as I was thinking about this talk in my book, I realized how ongoing those questions continue to be. Uh, you know, we currently are in a, uh, in a moment where supposedly we are post-race and post-feminist, where race, ethnicity, uh, gender, or sexuality are no longer relevant to federal, state, local, academic policies regarding hiring, public services, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and where academically people still continue to question why this work is being done. So part of what I want to do, kind of underlying my presentation, is, is think through what it means to do the scholarship and what it means to do the scholarship in this particular moment. Before I start, I just want to quickly point out that I recognize the term Latina and Latino is problematic. It is itself a homogenizing term. That said, uh, I use it from a Latino studies perspective where the term is really grounded in kind of a grassroots political orientation and where part of the scholarship is to think through comparatively the ethnic specific differences within and amongst group, uh, within and amongst uh, groups within Latinidad, but also to think about like what the, the advantages and disadvantages of being a, uh, a cohesive group or categorized as a group of group means. So I just want to say I'm going to use the term Latino Latino. I recognize it to be problematic. So, um, okay. Part of what I want to talk about uh, briefly at first is just kind of situate my work theoretically. And forgive me if it's highly theoretical. <laughs> Sarah and I were just talking about this. Uh, and then we'll get through some very specific examples uh, towards the end. Um, so 
Michel Foucault argues in Breath of Biopolitics that U.S. neoliberalism is brought into play as much uh, during the 19th century by the uh, anti-federal government right as it is by the individual rights politics of the pluralistic uh, left. The push towards conservative market rationalities and the progressive pool of multicultural identity and demands for civil and uh, civil rights and liberties has produced <coughs> has produced, as Brenda Weber, Sarah Manny mm -hmm. Weiser, Lisa Lowe, and others suggest, a cultural environment defined by self-regulation and self-discipline as public policy where racial, ethnic, and gender identity no longer matter, and simultaneously where the uh, what is that? Back here. Okay. Where the demand uh, for uh, racial, ethnic, and gender identity is equally a uh, uh, commodity good, right? So we're in this moment where there's uh, uh, where the push is towards uh, individuals regulating themselves and identity not being central, and at the same time being completely central to economic change, uh, especially within a um, media environment. So as Sarah Benet Weiser argues in her work on Nickelodeon, it, illi it, it illustrates um, the conditional demand for ethnic, racial, and gender identity. Gender identity must be normative, and ethnic and racial identity must always be ambiguously coded, so as not to disturb uh, gender and racial hierarchy. So part of... Uh, Um, so part of what I want to think through, um, what I do in my book and what I want to think through today, is the way that uh, media uh, production and content and the commodification of gender and ethno-racial identity function uh, to, as part of a normalizing society that depends on establishing discipline over a particular body while regulating populations who are privileging the, goal, the normative. At the same time, I recognize that the very same discourse that is disciplining can also be evoked by the by the very populations that seek to discipline uh, to talk back and to stake claim to visibility. Right. So it's uh, it's a, a, a process in tension. It's both disciplining and can be used to work against that disciplinary discourse. Global mainstream media production and content and its commodification of gender, ethno-racial identity, then function as a codeine-like technology of power. In order to think through that, I use the concept of symbolic colonization to examine the disciplinary technology of global mainstream media discourse to survey and normalize the ethno-racial gender body uh, at the same time that that discourse can be used to speak to Latinidad by groups within that category to give meaning and cultural significance to Latina bodies to increase the commodity exchange of uh, racial capital. So why Latinas? Most of you probably are familiar with these statistics, but Latinas, uh, Latinos in the United States are currently 15.7% or 48 million of the U.S. population. California is even uh, uh, bigger, right? 30, close to 38%. So we see these profound demographic shifts, and uh, Latinos are one of those groups that is increasing exponentially. Uh, and, uh, and so in addition to that, it's also a group that is very young um, and uh, is expected to, to, to continue to be the largest ethno-racial minority category in the 18 to 49 range for many years to come, which as some of you know, is one of the desirable categories or the desired category by media marketing professionals, right? They're the ones that consume. And so um, I think uh, not only now are they the largest category, but as we see from these statistics, it's probably going to remain that way for quite a while. <coughs> So, uh, so Latinas, uh, Latina bodies, both U.S. and foreign-born, uh, continue to uh, uh, okay. Let so Latinas uh, now number 15.8 percent. They're the largest ethno-racial category within that desired demographic. 
Um, I want to think about the way, uh, so not only the size and the, uh, and, and the roles of Latinos as consumers, but they've also played uh, a very interesting visible role uh, within the mainstream media for um, almost two centuries at this point. Uh, as the work of Myra Mendeville, Clara Rodriguez, and Ana Lopez uh, document, beginning with World War II and the Good Neighbor Cinema era, Latinas such as Lupe de Les, Dolores del Rio, and Carmen Miranda, they've uh, played a central symbolic role in mediating the uneasy relationship between the United States, Mexico, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Throughout the 19th and 20th century, these uh, foreign and desirable non-U.S. Latina bodies uh, spoke to the uh, geographical, economic, and political threat to the U.S. Uh, to U.S. national identity and symbolized the possibilities for coexistence, but often through white sexual assimilation, that is, assimilation uh, in interracial relationships with white men, and through U.S. cultural incorporation. Today, Latina bodies, both U.S. and foreign-born, continue to embody the cultural threat and desire, uh, in, uh, 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 the cultural threat and um, both desire. They present an unethically, uh, unethically undetermined, racially flexible, globally commodifiable body, as we see in the scheme of Longoria at Florio. Um, and they also <coughs> exist in a media environment of near invisibility for Latino Latino actors, characters, and use figures. The hyperbility then of some Latino bodies are asked to symbolically stand in the community at large, and that's part of what I want to think through. How do they do that? What's the significance of that? Why does it matter? As such, Latinas present a provocative opportunity to illustrate the complex representational uh, politics by which differences in the U.S. population are managed through the global mainstream via symbolic colonization. As I, so when I talk about symbolic colonization, I'm talking about the media signifying practices that manufacture Latinidad both as a homogenous construct, panethnic construct, and at the same time, racialized Latinidad as other than black and white and always foreign to U.S. national identity and culture. And we're just going to look at a very brief intro to one of my favorite movies, Bring It On, Fights the Fish. <laughs> <laughs> that always reinforce notions of heterosexuality. But I really love the blurring in that brief introductory film. You know she's Latina, uh, yet uh, you, you don't really have a sense of her ethnic specific identity. Of course, the actress is Afro-Cuban, and she plays a character that's Afro-Cuban in Los Angeles, which there are a minority here. <laughs> so, um, but also, you get uh, the visual signifiers of murals, uh, very much taken from uh, specifically Mexican Chicano spaces in Los Angeles uh, against the background of world music by Spanish artist Alavina. But it doesn't matter because all of these things work together to signify Latinidad, to signify uh, the character Lina and Milan as both familiar uh, to U.S. and global audiences and simultaneously racially foreign, exotic, and other.
when I talk about Latinidad uh, and the Latina body, I want to talk about it as a gendered body. Obviously, I'm looking at mostly biologically female bodies, but part of what I want to think through is the way it's not necessarily connected to biology. Lucila Vargas defines the gendering of Latinidad as the womanish construction, both not only achieved by downplaying masculine Latino voices, but also by relying on common sense associations and metaphors that link Latinos to women as signs and thus to qualities that a patriarchal capitalist structure regards as unworthy. And so what I like about this image, this is a clip art uh, put out by media marketing professionals. Um, and uh, you really see the kind of stability of, of families and women as a dominant signifier. Um, and then, of course, American Family, which is no longer on the air, uh, which did center around the uh, patriarch, but um, the key character was actually the, the surrogate mother for the deceased mother in the, in the show, right? Played by Princess Marie. Uh, but the, the sort of focus on family, on heterosexual families, is, I argue, a very gender discourse. Uh, that's very much linked to uh, femininity and, and, and powerlessness to some extent in the United States. Okay, so now we're going to look at some uh, case studies and I'm going to briefly run through this one. Um, I've published quite a bit on it, so slow me down. It, and some of you might be too young to remember at Leon at this point. No, I hope not. But, um, okay, so um, one of the, uh, because women and, and uh, and mothers and immigration is one of the primary frames uh, through which stories about Latinidad is told. It's not surprising that one of the most covered news stories um, in the U.S. media, at least according to the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, is that of young Elian Gonzalez, the Cuban boy that was uh, left astray uh, by his mother who died on her way to the U.S to bring him uh, to <coughs> democracy and capitalism and away from communism. So one of the things like, that's interesting is the way very early uh, coverage of the story focused on Elizabeth, Elizabeth's uh, as good mother, Elizabeth and her self-sacrifice. And uh, she was really taken up as a symbol by the Cuban exile community of the kind of identity they wanted to embody and the kind of foreign policy they wanted in place. Uh, the, the sort of uh, restrictive policies between U.S. and Cuba. And she was often uh, invoked uh, within this kind of racialized ethnic white privilege by both the community, and it was a, a privilege that was generally assumed by most of the news media covering the story at the time, right? That this was a political story, that this was about the relationship between U.S. and Cuba, uh, U.S. Cuban foreign policy, uh, and the coverage during this time was relatively positive to the Cuban American community. This is uh, the same photo taken up by a protester. We see that change quite rapidly uh, when the U.S., uh, when President Clinton at the time, and Janet Reno, pulled uh, their support for keeping Elian in the U.S. Um, and we also saw, of course, the, the resonances of the anti-immigration uh, sentiments left over from the 90s in Miami in particular, uh, the sort of fear of globalization and what immigration was doing to uh, Miami and other global cities. Um, and most importantly, critiques by the, ethno, uh, by the ethnic and racial minority press towards the special privileges that Cuban exiles had, the special political privileges that Cuban exiles had. had. So we see uh, during this time a market shift in the type of coverage, um, the type of uh, much more critical coverage of the Cuban exile community, and one which shifted from uh, Mighty Stacy's as, uh, as happy surrogate mother to kind of irrational, illogical, uh, potentially a, abusive, uh, unstable mother, right? Um, and we also see uh, that kind of framing occur with how the community itself was covered. Right, it's hyper-religious, hyper-feminine, uh, out of control, irrational, illogical. Uh, a lot of the public discourse about uh, the protests in Miami and nationally, uh, some even by the ethnic and racial minority press, often questioned the motives of the Cuban exile community. 
right, the privilege that they had and the motives, often compared them to the civil rights protests and said, these are the wrong kinds of minorities. They, uh, they've been invited into this country. They don't have a right to do this. Uh, they shouldn't be allowed to do this. They're behaving in ways that are, uh, that are uh, anti-American. Some women, such as uh, Elvira Arellano, uh, who is a very famous uh, uh, amnesty uh, case from Chicago, are, n are never allowed to have the kind of uh, ethnic white privilege that Elizabeth and the Cuban exile community had uh, at one point during uh, the Elian coverage. Um, so uh, she, uh, who is, uh, was a Mexican immigrant, undocumented, uh, who had a U.S. born son, he was born in Chicago, uh, and was attempting to stay here with her son after she was picked up in an immigration raid at Chicago O'Hare Airport, uh, was never, the public discourse about her, the editorials in the Chicago paper, uh, the uh, talking points by Bill O'Reilly, were, all, were uh, always very critical of both of uh, Elvira as a mother, Elvira as a political activist, right? She was questioned as using her son as an actor baby, uh, her motives not really being maternally pure, being politically motivated, uh, about her uh, being duplicitous, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The racialization of Manis Lacy's the Cuban exile community and Arellano as un-American marked the ways that they uh, challenged the dominant gender signifiers of Latinidad, of the, the good domestic mother and the heterosexual family. Their political activism, their desire to make their voices and not their bodies heard, uh, are gendered and racialized by the public discourse, by the local news media in particular. They are made obedient to establish racial formations that always position Latinas as exotic bodies, as perpetual foreigners, as ethno-racial outsiders, as non-American. Okay. Motherhood and families, oops, I'm gonna just go back. Um, I wanna talk about entertainment for a little bit. So, so motherhood and, um, and families is often the predominant narrative space allowed to Latina characters and actors in the media as well. So as I mentioned, symbolic colonization is a normalizing discourse, <coughs> a subtle form uh, of a discourse that establishes control over the economy of the body uh, for Latina actors. It's one of the technologies of powers that also allow Latinas in the media to be visible uh, and to provide a space of representational agency for themselves. We know Sofia Vergara, is Latina because uh, her body is marked uh, by very specific signifiers, of course, the bountiful breast, which this YouTube clip has managed to edit all together in one uh, handy little 30 second video. Uh, her, uh, their, their, their booties, dark hair, dark eyes, tan but not black skin. Uh, uh, it illustrates the way that global uh, mainstream media discourses and those work uh, works produce, quote, a constant pressure to conform to the same model. Lopez, Hayek, Sofia, Regada, and others uh, knowingly participate in the commodification of their bodies by reifying the dominant gendered and racialized signifiers of Latina. Their physicality provides them the racial capital they need to increase their value for the global media marketplace. So I want to think through another example uh, because it, it really it, uh, looks at, I think, the tensions uh, that, uh, is, that are embedded in symbolic colonization as a technology of power. Uh, what makes Frida especially interesting, of course, is that Salma Hayek is one of the co-producers and Julie Taymor is one of the directors, in fact, one of the few women directors in the U.S strategically produced a very particular construction of gendered Mexican identity as authentic, right? And we, uh, we see some of the ways that happens between this book cover of a uh, photo of Frida Kahlo and, and photograph of, uh, promotional photograph of the movie by, uh, by Hayek. Actually, that's not true. This is uh, Anne Leibovitz's photo. Um, 
uh, in vogue. Um, by, so part of what they do is focus on the connections between Kalo, they foreground Kalo, her indigenous culture as authentic, and then foreground Hayek and her Mexican nationality, even though she's a US citizen now, um, as authentic as well. Their physical symptoms, their, their physical, uh, sorry, uh, physical symbols, uh, their physicality uh, is used by the film's directors, producers, and actress uh, to situate both women as key cultural symbols, as authentic Latinas, as authentic Mexicanas, to tell what many considered an unmarketable story, right? So they focus on the physicality, on the authenticity of Chicago, and also on the love story, the heteronormative st love story, which is, of course, part of the uh, dominant narratives about Latinidad. And I'll just show a very brief scene. Well, I need a little proof. 
soul is all you know about me with no sex again. Uh, let's see. Your name is Carla. Oh, yes. You are Latina. Mm-hmm. You're a nurse. Your father's dead. Wait, I got three sisters. Turn two sisters? Well, I'm sure you have a brother who's a huge jerk off. Tell me what's my middle name. Okay, I'm tired of this game. Let's forget it. I give up. I guess you win again. But it's not just me who gets mixed up by all this crazy ethnic stuff. Sorry. Even I know. Dominican. Oh, yeah. Did I grow up in Illinois or was it Michigan? How long before we met was I in medicine? Okay, so, <laughs> that's a great clip. I highly recommend you choose it. Yeah. Uh, so, part of the reason I picked this clip is because uh, Judy Reyes, who is a media uh, activist and works uh, in Broadway to expand uh, representations of ethnic and racial minorities um, in, in New York mm-hmm. as well as in California, um, I think uh, this little skit does a nice job of decentering the very narratives which are used to to modify Latinidad, right? She's uh, Dominican, uh, which is a, a not the part of the, the normal representations of Latin, or the normative representation of Latinidad we see, but she also demands specificity uh, at a time when homogenization within the mainstream media is, is the norm. Uh, she also uh, does uh, very subtle things, which you may or may not know, like the fact that, she, uh, the folk, that she's from Illinois and Michigan, of course, where the new Latino destination places, as opposed to where we would expect her from New York or, or Florida, right? So all of these things that decenter uh, the normative discourse about Latinidad. Um, and, uh, and so it becomes, as part of Judith Butler argues, quote, a hindrance, a stumbling block, a point of resistance, and a starting point of opposing strategy, right? It introduces something that uh, disrupts the normalizing discourse. It illustrates the multiplicity of Latinidad in this film, right? Where she uh, disrupts the sort of uh, dominance of, of Puerto Ricans and Mexicans uh, in the media uh, and, uh, and troubles the multiplicity of women as well, right? She's uh, not uh, she's not just a mother, she wants to be a, a professional, she is a medical professional, uh, she wants to have that part of her life as part of her important identity, right? So it disrupts all the kinds of things we've been talking about. It illustrates the way that Latinas function in very radically hybrid ways, occupying multiple categories of identity and producing potential zones of dis, uh, disjuncture in historically established U.S. understandings of ethnic and racial formations. So um, Sotomayor and the conservative backlash against her, I suggest, was influenced as much by her perceived political affiliation and potential judicial philosophy as it was informed by the ways she challenged this dominant gendered and racialized discourse of Latinidad and Puerto Riqueña identity in particular. Right? Puerto Riqueñas are often um, constructed as, uh, as poor mothers, as hyper-fertile, <coughs> hypersexual, right? So way back to uh, West Side Story. Uh, And so uh, in an era also where ethnicity and race is not supposed to matter, Sotomayor invoked her identity in service of her communities um, and uh, states claim to to her identity, um, highly educated, divorced, unmarried, and childless. She was in many ways not the the dominant representation of female Latinidad or gendered Latinidad. Um, her inability to perform Latina normativity as much a, a threat at her, as her judicial philosophy. Uh, an empowered and powerful Latina voice at a time when Latinas were often constructed as national threats uh, to immigration or constructed as passive, uh, hyper-feminine uh, objects of desire. We'll just look at a, a brief clip from Fox News, which I love because uh, Senator Graham is attempting to situate her right along these signifiers of irrationality, hyper emotional uh, instability, and uh, and Sotomayor's performance. Um, her response to him is, in many ways, all the kinds of things that you you don't uh, that that is not desired by Fox. It's not you know that the Republicans don't want to see performed. Uh, by her. Let's talk about you. I like you. 
by the way, or whatever that matters. Since I made another party, that, that ought to matter to you. One thing that stood out about your record is that when you look at the almanac of the federal judiciary, lawyers anonymously rate judges in terms of temperament. And here's what they said about you. She's a terror on the bench. She's temperamental, excitable, she seems angry. She's overly aggressive, not very judicial. She does not have a very good temperament. She abuses lawyers. She really lacks judicial temperament. She believes in an out of control, she behaves in an out of control manner. She makes inappropriate outbursts. She is nasty to lawyers. She attacks lawyers for making an argument she does not like. She can be a bit of a bully. Some lawyers do find that our court, which is not just me, but our court generally is described as a hot bench. It's a term of art lawyers use. It means that they're peppered with questions. Lots of lawyers who are unfamiliar with the process in the Second Circuit find that tough bench difficult. We won't look at the response after this, which is equally humorous. But one of the things that I think Sotomayor stood for was the sense in which Latinos are not supposed to speak for themselves. We're not supposed to have a political voice. She does not behave in those kind of normative, normalizing ways that media discourses construct Latinos as supposed to be behaving. So I want to end just by thinking through Ugly Betty, which is no longer on the air, of course, most of you know. Because it, again, really illustrates this tension in very interesting ways. One of the top rated shows in that demographic category that I mentioned, it exemplifies the ways Latinos embody media industry efforts to use ethnic difference, racial ambiguity, and multicultural accents to sell products and programming to global audiences. To succeed in the global marketplace, as Ugly Betty shows us, ethnicity must be watered down, ethnic difference must be contained, and made familiar through safe, universalized, racialized stories, even safe, right? A lot of the anti-affirmative storylines of the show make her safe, right? Make ethnic and racial minority women safe. The storylines dealing with love, family, community, and social acceptance serve the ideological imperative of neoliberalism and the American dream of meritocracy. However, fans of the shows also focused on the queer storylines in the text, and I just want to show a slightly longer clip. I'll stop it. Mom, emergency. The weatherman said there's going to be a blizzard tonight. Well, Justin, don't worry. We will get you into the city for the SBA. Like you promised me the new Fermi CD, which I still don't have. Come on, Mom. Don't fuck with my heart. Justin, your father's not even going to be here until 6 o'clock. It'll be okay. Fine, but by this one minute of the first act, do you think this is even now? Okay. I knew it. 28. I told you we should have done earlier. I promise you, you really need the overture. Mom, I appreciate the whole effort thing, but everyone knows that there's no overture in Paris, right? Yeah, everyone knows that. Is there something you want to tell your son, Justin? No way. This is not happening. Why, God? Why? One minute until curtain. This is the worst thing that's ever happened, and I am not exaggerating. Justin, honey, you know the whole show inside out. If you miss some of it, you know how it started. But Dad doesn't. And the curtain is up. I am so sorry. It's going to be okay. Dad, I know you really want to see it. and the beginning of the teeny bop revolution. Our heroines. Josie Turnbull. Chuck, totally adorable. She wakes and begins to sing. Excuse me. <laughs> oh, 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 woke up today. Feeling no way. I always do. Good morning, Baltimore. Every day is like an open door. Every night is a fantasy. Excuse me. 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 Excuse
like the Scrubs one in particular, um, is still about authenticity. It's about her being Dominican and him and you know her boyfriend missing that. Um, you know the the woman from um, Modern Family, the right, Colombian. Yeah, they can. yeah, my sister-in-law is Colombian and and is always telling me that she never has a problem with how the bodily, the kind of bodily representation right. of yeah. of her in Modern Family. But she's always saying things like. 
which he's talking about that's so Peruvian, yeah. right? You know, or something. You know, that that's yeah. not Colombian. That's not right. what we say in Colombia. Yeah. That's not what yeah. we how we think in Colombia. But it's so it's a it's a you know kind of gesture towards authenticity. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, you know, if part of decentering and part of reimagining and part of opening up spaces necessarily means letting go of authenticity, and if that's the case. You know, um, what what do we put in its place as a central category of analysis, as a point of entry into thinking about media representation that is progressive rather than, you know, does damage? You know, how what takes the place of authenticity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think you're right. I mean, in the Frida, uh, and I've written about this in the Frida case study, we see, and um, Coco Fusco often talks about this, the battle over authenticity who gets to represent whom. And uh, and we see that at play there, right? The way that uh, perhaps uh, Samahai is not authentic enough to represent uh, Frida Kahlo. Uh, and so people take issue with how authentic she really is, how authentic the sets are, uh, the, the images they shoot in, in Mexico. Uh, and then there are audiences who are like, I don't care about authenticity. I just want visibility. And it's a and it's a, a dignified uh, visibility, right? We're not shown in little hot short shorts and like, uh, like Sofia Vergara or like Jennifer <laughs> Lopez, yeah. Uh, and so uh, and so that's what's important to them. Um, and you know what's interesting is I teach a class on commodifying difference, where authenticity is often the thing that we struggle through the entire semester because people want it. It's the natural it's the natural inclination, right? People are like, of course. You want authenticity in the kinds of representations that you see about yourself, and um, and I want to know that that is my identity, and I can identify with it, and it's accurate, and it represents me. Uh, but uh, you know, as you know, authenticity is so unstable, right? What is authentic to one person is not authentic to the other, and uh, and also when you get into police border wars over who gets to say what is authentic. That adds a whole other layer of, of, of really problematic conversation, right? Like who has the power to decide whether or not that particular uh, representation is going to be considered authentic or not. And so I don't have an answer to what takes the place of it, uh, but, and, and this is gonna be a cheap answer, I guess what I would like is just to see more kind of representations out there. So that you have a diversity of, of, of narratives, some which may be more problematic than others, but I think it's that richness that we don't have that makes those authenticity debates so difficult, right? So if there weren't such scarce images, if there weren't, if visibility wasn't so scarce, uh, perhaps authenticity wouldn't really matter, right? But, but it does because there's so few images about us out there, right? I think, according to Chong Noriega's latest survey, like five or six percent in film and television. So, um, you know, compared to 15.7 percent of the population, so not that you know not that direct uh, representation. But yeah, so I, I think that's my you know how I would think about it is is that hopefully opening up access to media production, to the kinds of narratives that are out there, which we begin to see a little bit, right, with Scrubs um, and, uh, you know, to some extent with Ugly Betty, but, you know, would be the way, because you can't get, I mean, I think the authenticity debate is not really a productive one. Just to follow up really quick, I think, I don't think that that's a cheap answer at all, but um, um, I also think that maybe, this whole notion of racial ambiguity is something that yeah. we should kind of explore a little bit more carefully um, um, uh, in the sense that you've written about this. And by the way, she, Isabel has written this great, great essay on Salma Hayek. Um, that isn't a book that I edited, so here's a double plug for both of us. Um, um, but um, the notion of racial ambiguity, I think, is really interesting in terms of how we might turn it on, on its head and right. use it in a way that is actually progressive <laughs> rather than commodified, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, and kind of push at its borders rather than just right. kind of assume that it means just about, it, that it's just about safety mm -hmm. and it's just about making an image palatable for a white audience. Right. 
you know, that there's a way in which we can take ambiguity and make it something and more. And make it productive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a really good point, um, as ambiguity itself is entering the discourse. Yeah. I just have a quick question. Um, I, we read the introduction for the year. We read the introduction of the book, and it was talking about um, there was there was a point where you talked about the portrayal of Latinas within the Latino community. How um, you know, novela stars and like movies are usually lighter skinned, right. but then compared with the images that we have here. So we have got is a natural blonde, light skin, right. which has to like tan and dye her hair to appear more Latina. Yeah. So in I guess the the journey to find authenticity within the medium, how does that relate also? I guess how to find a happy medium is what I wonder between what we want here for authenticity, but then what's also portrayed in the media within the Latino community. Yeah. Uh, so where is I guess where's the happy medium? Is it in finding authenticity here? Should we also combat those images within that Latino community? Or is it that we find something in between? Yeah, that's a good uh, question, the sort of relationship between the Latino media and the mainstream media. Uh, And of course, like in the Latino media, we often see like even more sort of hypersexualized, gendered uh, representations of, of Latin American and uh, and and Latinas, um, yeah. I you know uh, happy medium between. I mean, I think you know as I mentioned to to uh, Sarah, I think letting go of authenticity is more productive than trying to find one authentic representation that is better than another. Because I don't think you'll ever get that. Uh, I mean, I think um, at least uh, in you know Univision, um, even though they might have Sofia Vergara as, as news anchors, <laughs> right, uh, low cleavage and the big boobs, um, uh, they uh, they do provide visibility and voice to stories that we often don't see in the U.S. Uh, media, right? So even though they commodify uh, bodies, gender bodies in very similar ways, they also tell narratives that we otherwise wouldn't know. My parents are always telling me about stories that I haven't heard of uh, because they see it on a movie, see on news, and I'm like, oh, that can't possibly be true. You're lying. And then I look it up, and I'm like, oh my god, they're right. It's just the U.S. media doesn't cover that, di- didn't cover that story. Um, and so, you know, I would say uh, Univision plays a very important function, and, and other Latino media play a very important function. And we saw that in the immigration rights marches. Uh, uh, that uh, the U.S. There, or the English mainstream media doesn't do, whether or not we can ask for them to have better or more authentic representations, I think is a difficult one. And I would say, eh, I'm not so concerned with how authentic or positive the representations are. I, I would like to see the diversity. I'd like to see more Univision news-like stories in the U.S. media, and perhaps more racially diverse stories, uh, you know, more diverse representations of, of Latino women in Univision. So I have one question, which is, Ugly Betty is kind of an interesting example in some ways in this discussion about authenticity as well. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to um, the the production of that story or some version of that story in various um, various mm-hmm. Latin countries, right? So there's an Argentinian version. They're right. very kind of ethno and country um, politically specific versions of that show. And I don't know the show well enough to um, one of one of the students here has done a really a really nice piece of work on it. But I wonder if if that kind of you were speaking about multiplicity of images, um, if there's something in that case study that says something interesting about looking at a particular story that gets retold in these various Absolutely. Various and um, I have a paper in progress that kind of looks at that, so I, I'd love to see the work being produced here and make sure I cite it yeah, appropriately. Sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, so that's, uh, Ugly Betty is really interesting. Of course, it's based on the original Colombian telenovela, Yo Soy Betty La Fea, which I have to uh, admit I am a, a fan of and watch it over and over again. I know it's sick. Uh, and what I think is interesting about that is it has some very similar markers as Ugly Betty. Like you see the process of translation and what it takes to make a story 
global within the English language mainstream media, even though Yo Soy Be Betty, uh, or uh, Yo Soy Betty La Fea is more global than Ugly Betty, right? It's all it's been reproduced in I don't know how many languages all over the world, uh, numerous numerous times. Uh, but one of the things the original does that Ugly Betty doesn't do, of course, is it's much more ethnic specific to Colombia. Uh, the settings, the characters, uh, even at the uh, even at the same time, though it attempts to be very global within Latin America. It references trade relations between Central American countries. It makes an effort of bringing in artists from throughout Latin America, Mexican artists, Colombian artists, uh, and so it's a really interesting global text in that way. The attempt in the way it attempts to globalize itself within the telenovela genre and Latin America. And of course, you know, some of the stories are highly universal. Love is love, you know, heterosexual love stories, popular no matter what language. Uh, and uh, you know, one of the it, things that Ugly Buddy does that is different and that makes it unique is I think the way that it treats the queerness of the characters and the storylines, which of course the original and all its iterations don't really do, where gay identity is treated very comedically uh, and often in a derogatory way of the butt of the joke, as opposed to the very nuanced way that Ugly Betty did it, where it's much more dignified and respectful. So that's one of the things that translates differently. There uh, was a question in the back. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think there's an aesthetic element that might be explored, perhaps you're doing it already in your work. But I was struck by the fact that, that, that some of the clips you showed were musical numbers which by their very nature are disruptive narratively speaking. That's true. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, they tend to also normalize a certain element within Latinidad right. and other racial uh, ethnicities that are exoticized through music, musicality and entertainment right. qualities. Blacks have certainly been subject to that as well, and Latinos as well. Mm -hmm. So anyway, on one hand it disrupts, yeah. it opens up, and on the other hand it brings back and normalizes. Yeah, and I don't uh, talk a lot about music, but that's a great point because even in the and even with excuse me with the queer, the queer, yeah. queer as well. Yeah, things are normalizing as It is, and uh, with the Scrubs example, you know, she does. Uh, uh, she's, they're doing a tango, which is yeah. not yeah. dominican, yeah. right? <laughs> um, and you know, but again, it functions in some ways the way that the Bring It On uh, music and Bring It On functions, which is in this very normalizing way. So yeah, I think that's a really great observation and it would be worth looking at more closely the function of music. Uh, scholars like Angara Valdivia have, look, have looked at the function of dance within discourses of Latinidad, uh, but I'm not familiar with any work done on music and that, that would be fruitful, I think, to look at, especially now given the kind of this, uh, resurgence of musicals um, and uh, almost every television show, including House, which I couldn't believe it, it ha it's having a musical episode, um, and so what is the role of musicals in this era, this post-race, post-feminist era? What what does it do? How does it function to disturb and and also to be center? That's a really good observation. Okay, I think that is it for today. Let me quickly announce: next week is spring break, as I'm sure you all know. <laughs> the week after, we'll have a joint uh, session with the Lear Center, and. This will feature Joe Caraganis from the Social Science Research Council. Uh, Joe and a group of collaborators have recently completed a multi-year study of media piracy in emerging economies, and they're about to release a very uh, significant report. Don't let them see my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, their report will basically say that the uh, issue of piracy has been misunderstood and misstated, <coughs> and that it's really not what you're hearing from the NPAA, big surprise. Uh, a representative from the NPAA has been invited to attend and respond. <laughs> we'll see if uh, if somebody shows up, maybe Chris Dodd. Or, you know. We'll see if that's in two weeks, and join me in thanking you today. <laughs>